Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Tara Delzell and I am the director of the West Region. And I'm also one of the ambassadors for our Women in Tech Network here at SUSA. As you know, today is March 8th, which is International Women's Day. And SUSA happens to be celebrating International Women's Day the entire month of March. By doing so, we're conducting In Conversation With, which is a series of talks organized by SUSA's Women in Tech Network. This year's theme is Choose to Challenge. The events taking place this month celebrate incredible women who choose to challenge. For this session, we are joined by an inspiring woman who chooses to challenge every single day. Her name is Dr. Temple Grandin, and she is such an incredible story to share. We know we won't fit it all in the hour, um, but we'll try to highlight as much as possible. Before I formally introduce her, I will share some details about the format of the call. I'm excited to share that this event has been opened up to an external audience. And I'd like to take a moment to thank some of those external groups that have joined us today. I see we have, have Dreams, Autism Society of North Carolina, we have some of our business partners, Nova Coast, KPMG, Tech Data. We also have Boulder Valley School District, University of Arizona, and Riverland Community College. We have many more, and we thank you for your time today and joining us in this forum. The first portion of this call, Dr. Grandin and I will be talking. And during that time, we encourage the audience to submit questions. And you can do so in the upper right hand corner of your screen in the chat field. When you do that, please take a moment to share what organization you're with and how you heard about this event. Susa did an incredible job advertising this and we'd love to know if you heard about it on a Facebook group or LinkedIn or perhaps a Susa employee. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin is an autism activist and a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Dr. Grandin has pursued a career in science as a scientist and livestock equipment designer. She has written numerous books, received multiple accolades for her work, and has a full feature film made about her incredible life. Dr. Grandin, thank you for being here today. It's really good to be here today. So I thought I'd start off the conversation about a topic that you are very passionate about. When we spoke last, you mentioned that the education system needs to empower the object visualizer. Can you explain to the audience what that means and how and why that is important to you? Well, I'm an extreme visual thinker and the HBO movie showed how I think completely in pictures. Now there's actually research that shows that there's different kinds of thinking. I'm what scientists call an object visualizer. I see everything in pictures. Now another kind of mind is the visual spatial. Now often these get mixed up. Object visualizer, the visual spatial are different. The visual spatial is more the pattern thinker, the mathematical thinker, the program thinker. And then of course we have our verbal word thinkers. And one of the things that an object visualizer cannot do is algebra. But there's a lot of things we can do and uh, you need us. We actually are losing skills in this uh, country. Uh, we no longer make the state of the art machine for making semiconductor sh chips. It comes from Holland. And I think one of the reasons for that is they've kept their skilled trades and a lot of object visualizers go into that. And when the, I found a picture of that machine in The Economist with all the covers off, I could tell by looking at it that there's a lot of skilled trades that went into that. Also the Mars Rover, the brand new Mars Rover. Somebody in a shop made all the parts for that thing. It's a one of the kind machine. It needs the, the object visualizer needs to be getting a lot more credit and, and they're getting screened out. Algebra is a gigantic barrier to screening them out. No, I am not a programmer, but you need me to prevent accidents like Fukushima because I see risk. Mathematicians calculate risk. I see the water flooding the site and drowning the emergency cooling pump. Yeah, now they have a seawall twice as high. There's another Fukushima reactor that's still going. And they have gigantic waterproof doors. I've looked them up on the website. So how do and we continue? Those, and they did not have those doors before. 
I would not have made that mistake because I could see the water flooding the site. They've got gigantic waterproof doors now. They did not have them before. So Dr. Grandin, how do we foster creativity in problem solving activities for our young children so we can embrace those, those minds, the very different minds that are out there? And the encourage biggest more mistake creativity? the schools made was taking out all the hands-on classes, art, sewing, woodworking, cooking, theater, auto shop, welding, taking out those classes, worst thing they ever did. Because the other problem is, the uh, people don't get exposed to enough uh, different things to find out what they might want to do. How right. can you know if you can play a musical instrument if you're not exposed? I was exposed to a little flute. I never could figure out how to play it. Or you have a child that's labeled autistic and he's a little math genius and people are so far into the label, they don't think to expose him to programming. There's no way you can get interested in programming if he is not or she is not exposed to it. Exposure is just so important. That's how I got into the cattle industry. I was exposed as a teenager at my aunt's ranch. And are you thinking the appropriate age is middle school or would you even say earlier? Well, we need to be doing hands-on things earlier, but mm -hmm. things like uh, being interested in fixing engines, okay, broken lawnmowers, they have a price of free. I always hear money being an issue. There's lots of resources out in the neighborhood, retired mechanics that are bored, They'd love to come in and teach small engine repair. Then the kid's going to find out, do I like engines or are they dirty things I don't like? But the thing is, you don't know until you try things. And I know people that own big metal fabrication companies who would be labeled autistic if they were a child today. These are people flying around in their private jets who would have been every label in the book when they were kids. In fact, I've been on several of those jets. So as you shared, everybody's mind works differently and you see things in pictures, but how as a society, do we identify those different mindsets and embrace them? Well, it will often show up around the third grade, eight years old. When I was eight years old, I was not able to read. I was one of those uh, kids that learned with phonics rather than sight words. Mother, mother homeschooled me on that. But around seven or eight years old, if kids are exposed to enough stuff, you're gonna find out, well, he's a mathematician, or this kid is a picture thinker because they'll be doing a lot of art. I love to build things out of cardboard, um, or, or a kid will be really good at writing. We need to take the thing the kid's good at and build on it. But if they don't get exposed to a lot of things, they don't develop a passion for stuff that they're not exposed to. And even you take the career of someone like Michelangelo, he was a sixth grade dropout. He dropped out of school at 12 years of age, but he was in an environment where there was art all over the place. He was raised in a family that used stone cutting tools. So there was some exposure there at a very, very young age. If he hadn't been exposed to the art, he wouldn't have done it. But now you are a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and I'm sure you come across incredibly brilliant minds so we, we talk about the, you know, the arts and the hands-on and the tangible activities as children, but we know there are these brilliant minds that we need to help embrace the math, the engineering and the science programs. How do you encourage your students and even our listeners today to embrace those types of programs? Well, the thing is, there's an amazing amount of stuff online. You go on something like Wolfram Mathematica, I like to get the kids to go onto Google Images and look up protein yes. symmetry, protein symmetry. You've got like cathedral window patterns and they're inside your body, isn't that cool? And then you can get the, our fractals, then you can get them involved in the math that, that goes behind that stuff. Then you tell them that JavaScript runs video games, JavaScript runs the screens in the SpaceX capsule, and you can actually find some of that programming online. This stuff is all free, I've looked it up. I've even looked up papers on how to do linear algebra for quantum computing. Now, I'm not gonna be doing this, but I know how to find the papers. And then you show those things to, to the right kind of kid. Um, they, I'm gonna probably use it for extra printer paper. Um, another math kid, he's gonna take off and it opens up a door. And yeah. where there's a lot of people that are mixtures of the different kinds of minds, but you get certain people that are extreme object visualizer like me or an extreme mathematician. Um, 
we also need to just let them move ahead in school. A lot of kids misbehave in school because they're bored, absolutely bored. And I, I can't believe some of this common core math. Ugh, I would have been lost. Um, there's a lot needs to be a lot more teaching arithmetic the way it used to be taught that I was able to do. Uh, but uh, you got a kid's little math genius. He wants numbers. He doesn't want this weird sort of verbalized math. I'd give them numbers. Right. Uh, get the old algebra books out of the attic. Get the geometry books. They'll either be an algebra kid or a geometry kid. You can find those books. They're in the attics. Dig them out. I heard you talk about the exposure. So if you've got a child that really is good with math, incorporate it in other areas of their life. Do Absolutely. a math game with them. Play with trucks and make it a math program or a game and just exposing them in different ways. I think that's very important. Well, and using the math for all different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's happening in the schools, it's sort of like in some schools, we can learn English, algebra, and sports. And in some schools, that's about all you can learn. Right. And then I see losing of skills. For example, right now, two brand new poultry processing plants have just been built, and all the equipment came from Holland. Very, very beautiful equipment, very expensive equipment. You're talking about a high-wage country here. And, and um, there's a, a pork processing plant, uh, similar stuff, a lot of equipment coming in from Europe. You're not talking about t-shirts from a, you know, a, a country that has low wages. You're not talking about you know, cheap clothing coming in. That's done for cost. You're talking about real expensive high-end stuff, like the chip making machine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from a little company in Holland. Yeah. Um, you see, you need to have both the more mathematical engineering and what I call the clever engineering department. I just read a fascinating article about a soft robot that swims like a stingray. Um, and I'd like to be looking into more about how some of that stuff came about. Like normally you just take all the electronic components and you put them on a circuit board. This one, each component is separated by wires so they can withstand the deep pressure and not have the parts rub up against each other and break. Um, you know, somebody had to figure that out. I'd be really interested to find out. I'm going to bet you there's an object visualizer in a, in a shop somewhere that thought some of that stuff up. Right. Yeah, there has yep. to have mathematics too, but I was looking at how they laid out the, the integrated circuits in that thing, each one separate little pieces of wire in between them. Well, we you have know, to encourage it in, in a silicone. Normally, you just slap it on a circuit board, but that doesn't work. I was just looking at that this morning. Well, we have to encourage these brilliant minds to stay in the tech industry and get into Silicon Valley and be able to, you know, continue to be programmers and developers. It's very well, important. Well, we've got to expose kids to programming. And right. I have had parents who were both programmers, have a brilliant math kid labeled autistic, and didn't think to expose their kid to programming. I've right. had that happen several times. It's so far in the autism box, but I have been out to Silicon Valley. Half those programmers are on the spectrum. Now I know people my age, I know a lady who does uh, program all the logic controllers. She's just a little bit younger than I am. She does them for major big factories and she's she's autistic. Um, I, I, you need some autism genes to be a good programmer. You see, a little bit of autism makes you more thinking rather than emotional, where programming is much more interesting than a lot of social stuff. See, autism is a true continuous trait. And if we didn't have some autism, we wouldn't have this technology that we're using right now. It's that simple. Because um, you think things like this get made by people that are um, interested in it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to talk about your experience. You've had a career in such a male dominated industry. And you know, when someone says the word cowboy, that word alone, I see a male figure. I don't think of a woman. Where did you find the strength and confidence to overcome such adversity in such a male dominated industry? Well, not everybody in the industry was bad. Where I had all the trouble, was middle management, foremans. Also, what helped me is I was freelance. Now, I had a very upsetting situation on my maybe my third design job. It was on a ranch, and the ranch foreman was making sexual moves towards me, and I rebuffed that, 
and he told his boss that my equipment did not work. Now, I could go on to another project. Now, that really upset me. And another really good mentor, a contractor who built the facility, said, yeah, you need to just keep on going. But let's say I've been working in a big tech company and that had happened. I would be able to go nowhere because since I was freelancing, I could go on to another job. Right. Um, but that was really bad. And it was all middle management. And the owners of the feed yards, the owners of some of these big places, uh, they were the, the good guys. No, it was the foremans. That's where almost all the trouble was. Now, the cattle industry, I think, is ahead of, of some sectors of the tech industry in terms of there's lots of women in the livestock industry now, lots and lots of them, yeah. but not when I came in in the early 70s. So what would you say to the youth out there, um, this, for folks that, and even young adults, that have to find inner strength, right? They need to continue to persevere. How did you do that? Because you had a lot of challenges that you needed to overcome. What would you share with the audience today about how they need to continue to persevere? I had some good mentors. Once I got out in the industry, I had my wonderful science teacher, Mr. Carlock, when I was in high school. But okay, now I'm out in the industry. And what helped me was there were some good people. One was a small contractor just starting his business that seeked me out to design his jobs. And uh, another one was a superintendent at the local Swift plant. Thing that's interesting, they're both former military officers. And I didn't realize that until I read the superintendent's obituary about a few years ago. Um, and these people were very supportive. I remember one of them said, you got to keep persevering. And, yeah. and if I hadn't had those mentors, I probably would have dropped out. Um, so mentors are so important. One was a contractor, a former Marine Corps captain. The other yeah. was the superintendent of the Swift plant. And he was, I found out was former military. I did not know that until I read his obituary. No, very important. So I know that you, you had a number of projects and you had um, folks that were challenging you. So you needed to challenge the situation and keep pushing forward. Was, it, was there any, ever a time when you challenged something and you regretted it or you realized the outcome wasn't what you expected? Well, there was, you see, one thing that helped me being freelance is that when one thing failed, there was other projects. Yeah. It wasn't like I worked for a tech company and a horrible boss who would just stop me. Right. I could go on to another project that had nothing to do with that boss. And a lot of people on the spectrum that have been very successful have started their own companies. Usually they keep them private. They don't like Wall Street. Um, and, or, you know, they've got a shop and they're doing a lot of different jobs, but uh, many of the successful people are independent businesses, some very small, some very, very large. Yeah, absolutely. So you've had incredible success over your career. You've done different projects. You've been engaged in different types of activities from the livestock design to being engaged in other projects throughout you know, North America. What would you say is your most memorable accomplishment? Well, I have you know things more on the engineering side. I did like my center track restrainer system. You know that went went over the mid '80s up to the early '90s. Started out with the calf version of it, and then then did a large cattle version. Um, you know, got that done. Now, one of the things that had the biggest effect on animal welfare was a very simple scoring system I developed for assessing meat packing plants, where you figure out what are the critical control points or key welfare indicators that really matter? What things do you measure? And I worked with McDonald's and other companies on implementing that. In terms of change in the industry, that probably made the most change. Now, one of the mistakes I made that a lot of engineers make in the beginning is they think tech can solve all the problems. I got all this equipment out there in these plants. All the big plants had my center track restrainer system. Half my clients tore stuff up and wrecked it. This would have been early 90s. The McDonald's stuff started in 1999. And when a big customer comes in there and you just make them fix the broken stuff, start managing it. I was amazed at the number of places we could fix with repairs, simple changes, and out of 75 suppliers, three plant managers had to be uh, fired because they had a terrible attitude. Um, 
I, I learned, yes, we need to have technology, but you also have to have management. Yeah, You have to have both. Well, and you've shared that sometimes the, the problem requires a simple fix and it doesn't need to be overcomplicated or overthought. And, and, you know, sometimes the most obvious fix is not thought of. Well, like putting waterproof doors on Fukushima. They did not have them. Right. Now they've got a seawall double the height that they had before and fancy watertight doors. They did not have them. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but um, all I know is if an electric pump doesn't run when I need it, it's not going right. to run under water. Put some watertight doors on it. That hadn't been done. It was that simple. That simple. That simple. And the same thing with the Boeing Max and the angle of attack indicator. So you've got a thing the size of a Sharpie pen here sticking out of the side of an airplane that measures air angle. Well, someone needs to ask you, well, you wired that up to the computer without telling the pilots? What if a pigeon breaks that thing off? Yeah, you know, it's default setting was to keep diving. Minor uh, detail. Yeah, that's pretty simple. Right. But you see, it's simple if you think about it visually. It's not simple if you think about it more mathematically. So you need to have both. Let's look at interfaces. The reason why the iPhone was so popular is because an artist designed the interface. Engineer mm -hmm. didn't design the interface. <laughs> you say the reason why Zoom took over is because you don't have to learn how to use it. That's, That's interface. True. That it is, is important. True. Some programmers tend to stick their nose up at, at the interface people, just like a lot of other people stick their nose up at skilled trades. But mm -hmm. you need to have both. And when I'm talking yeah. skilled trades, I'm talking the high end stuff. I'm not talking about roofing or laying asphalt. I'm, that's just labor work. But the real high end skilled trades, like inventing very clever, intricate uh, food packaging equipment, for example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The kind of stuff I'm talking about. So I just have a few more questions here for you, Dr. Granton. You know, you have shared that you've had wonderful tutors, you've had great teachers, you've had mentors that have influenced your life, and they've helped you grow as a person, yes, but they've have. also helped influence you to continue to seek education. Would you share with the audience the importance of seeking community, that people can't do these things alone? Well, there's, uh, there's so many things in the community. Um, I mean, some of these people that have big businesses now, they took uh, what saved them was the high school welding class. There's a guy who stutters, he's dyslexic, he's ADHD, rotten student, took a welding class, owns a metal fabrication company that sells stuff around the world, owns a big business. And there's another guy that I know that owns an even bigger business that would have been every diagnostic category in the book. We actually spent half an hour discussing what his diagnosis would have been at about age 12. Defiant, <laughs> <laughs> autistic, dyslexic, horrible student, you name it, he would have had. Right. Yeah, he's so the guy with the private jet. And I think one of the things I've tried to do now, the age I'm at it now at 73, is, uh, is uh, you know, I'm going back and forth between the industrial world and the autism world. I'm trying to bust them out of the disability silo. Because um, the problem you've got with autism is you're going from 25% to 50% of the programmers in Silicon Valley definitely have some of the traits to somebody who can't dress themselves. And it's all mm -hmm. called the same thing. You've got this huge spectrum. And the verbal thinkers I find get too locked into that. Like I can't believe it. Parents that were programmers, both of them, their eight-year-olds are math genius and they didn't think to introduce their kid to programming. I have run into several cases of that. Even they got too locked into the label. Well, how do you get that to change? What steps are you taking to further educate folks about encouragement early in age to get exposed oh, to different things? This is why I'm doing all these webinars. Yeah. Hey, and I'm, I'm working important. on a book right now on, on visual thinking and why it's important. And, right. and I'm, that's why I do all these um, online conferences. That's why I do my autism talks. Now, I think the other thing is, I always like to think of myself as a professor first, a mm -hmm. scientist first, then autistic, because I'm seeing too many people 
that get an autism label and it's becoming their total identity. Yeah. And I, a lot of people in Silicon Valley avoid the label. And I think the reason for that is they don't want to be totally uh, de uh, defined by the label. And there's a tendency to do that. There's still a lot of discrimination out there. Um, right. And, and uh, the other thing that a lot of these people that are really creative need to do is make portfolios. I, you know, my idea of an interview is lay the drawings on the table. I would just get the drawings, lay them out on the table, and show them to people. That's how that's how I did an interview. Put the drawings on the table and just show it. Here's some of my drawings right here. Yep. There are my book Thinking in Pictures. This is my book Thinking in Pictures. Just put it, just got a new um afterword in it. And in my book, The Autistic Brain, this is where I present some of the science on mm -hmm. the object visualizer and the visual spatial. And even though that book now is 2013, it's got a few years on it now. There's more research that just supports what's said in there. There are different kinds of minds, and I'm worried that we're screening out the um, object visualizers, and yeah. we need them. We need them. And when I see uh, uh, some of the things that, um, you know, like, like the chip making machine, I'm going, you've got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. It was the Physics behind that machine came from the US, came from university research in the US. But a little company in Holland made it. It's it makes the tiniest, smallest chips in the entire industry. Yeah. Yeah. So you've mentioned some of your books, and you know, in watching the movie and, and watching some of your, your talks, you've you've shared that you have a voice, you have this all of these fantastic ideas and you want them to be out there in the world for the betterment of society. We've heard a lot of what you have done, but would you please share what's next for you? What's your next challenge? Well, I think now as someone as an older person, I want to see younger people, you know, like, you know, go out there and be successful. And I'm seeing too many smart kids getting addicted to video games and they're going absolutely nowhere. Right. I'm seeing when kids get a label, there's like two places they go. They go to the basement to play video games, get out and have a life. I'm seeing too many problems with kids with a label not learning life skills. Uh, shopping, for example, things I was doing when I was seven. Um, and so I talked to a lot of autism groups and I have to talk about things like shopping. And uh, it's not some of my favorite subject to talk about, but I'm finding it's essential because you've got parents getting their kid doing all the academics I've seen them get a PhD, but they can't hold a job because they can't get up in the morning, get to work. Um, just basics. Um, and, and so I have to talk about, you know, teaching work skills to kids. Right. It's something I talk about all the time. Yep. You see, when you look at the granddads, there are all these granddads and grandmothers that have had good jobs and they find out they're on the autism spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. But that grandparent had a paper route and learned how to work. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Grandin, my last question for you, and then I'm gonna turn things over to Jenny Newell and she'll share with us some of the questions we've gathered from the audience. Will you be able to share a project with us? I know when we spoke last, there's some some exciting things that you're working on. Would you be able to share any of that with the audience? Well, one of the things we're working on right now with my student, Megan Corgan, is animals are visual thinkers. Animals think in pictures, they think in in uh, sounds, a tone of voice, how they communicate. Well, sometimes a horse will just spook for no reason. Well, yeah. so I thought what I'd try to do is we got a child's play set that looks really different when you turn it. Like for example, this stapler looks different here than like that. Now imagine if a stapler was 10 foot long and your horse saw it in a different orientation. So Megan went out and bought a children's play set that looks very different when you turn it. And she trained horses to go by it like 15 times till there's no reaction. She just led them by it. Then it's rotated. It turned into a new object. Very and cool. the horse noticed that. Now this experiment was all done in a very slow walk. So there'd be no um, safety issue. But if, they, but if you'd been galloping on the horse, riding it, he, he probably would have slammed on the brakes and dumped it. Because that... <laughs> Playset looks different when it's turned. Right. 
Now we have a gigantic cortex. So we're going to look at that and go, yeah, that's a play set. The horse just, it just looks different. Sure, sure. So Very that's something that we're just working on right now. Um, uh, animals, so I don't, if you want to understand animals, they live in a sensory based world. What are they smelling, hearing, seeing? I, I really work hard on trying to get my students to be better observers. You know, what are the cattle looking at? What's your dog looking at? Mm -hmm. And and they then start to do a lot of good observations with their own pets that they hadn't even thought about before because right. they had to get away from language and think about thinking in a different way. Very exciting. Great. So that's the things I'm working on now. And the other thing I'm all I've got now is getting back out in the road and talking to people. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, one thing that's been good about the online is, is, you know, a lot of stuff I've done now goes overseas, which is good. Mm -hmm. And you are welcome to record this. You want to post this this interview on some other media, you go right ahead and do it. I'm telling it now. That's a legal document for you because I'm on the camera here telling you that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you have incredible messages. Along with it. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and have Ginny Newell come back on and she's going to share any of the questions that the audience may have posted for us. Oh, thank you, Tara. Thank you, Dr. Grandin. And we've had quite a few questions come through already, so I'm going to get straight into it. So we've got a question here from a fan. He says you're an inspiration. He's a colleague of ours and he's the father of an autistic child. And his comment is, Many people on the spectrum resort to masking, even in a workplace or a class environment, which is inclusive. So the question is, this is exhausting, but it is felt as the only way to minimize stigma and discrimination. And what are your thoughts on masking? Well, so I've been, I've been talking to several people that you know, had this problem. A lot of it's sensory. You're in a noisy environment. It's really hard to... Um, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to screen out the noise. Um, the, one of the things, there's a lot of problems now with lighting. We got all these new electronic lights. Now, I don't have this problem. Sensory issues are extremely variable. But some people on some of the LED lights can see them flicker. The problem is I don't know which ones. It used to be just get rid of fluorescent lights, but it's not that simple now. So you can have those problems. Um, the another problem is burnout, um, and a lot of that's caused by anxiety. When I was in my mid 20s, uh, I was having all kinds of health problems from anxiety. I take antidepressant medication. It's all described in here, and I've been on it for 40 years. In fact, I don't know if I could have done what I did without it. And I would, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody they should take medication. I just tell you read my experiences in there. I'd rather have you read it in there. Then I uh, tell about it now. I I've just been corresponding with a lady that was that's in her mid twenties right now, and um, she's been taking some antidepressants. Um, the big mistake that gets made is too high a dose. You get too high a dose, you're going to get agitation and insomnia. The doses on the label are wrong for anxiety. Throw the label away. You uh, probably only need a starter dose, maybe half a starter dose. That's all you need. You're not treating depression. You're treating anxiety, but. I know other people that have um, that's been very, you know, a little bit of Prozac really made a difference. I've been on it 40 years. I don't dare stop taking it. Um, I uh, don't know what happened if I'd go off it. I've seen some people that were very successful on a med, the right med, I want to emphasize the right med, right. went off it. Complete disaster. Complete. Total unmitigated disaster. Um, but I uh, you know, now if you do freelance work, but even, you know, as I got to, into my early 30s, my anxiety got worse and worse and worse. Colitis got worse and worse and worse. Uh, I don't know if I would have any insides left if I hadn't gone on that on that drug. And the colitis didn't, not completely cure, but about 90% of it cleared up. You know, just in a week, it was because my nervous system was no longer in a total state of fright. And I, I've now... I had an experimental brain scan and found out that my amygdala, my fear center, was three times larger than normal. And it was just turned on for no reason. <clears throat> my nervous system was like I was in a jungle full of dangerous animals, lions and tigers and stuff like that, when there were no predators around. 
And then when I went on the medication, it damped it down. I'm, and I'd be very careful about some of this really uh, high potent, high powered pot that's out there. This stuff's five times stronger than the pot that we had in my generation. And I've read some really bad things on PubMed about it, really bad things. Um, uh, there's certain types of pot that can make you paranoid. Uh, this stuff's not your grandfather's or grandmother's pot. I, uh, you know, I would use uh, uh, commercial antidepressants, but this is a problem. And I'm, and it, I look at it, you know, back when I, I met in my book, I wrote the old DuPont slogan, "Better Living Through Chemistry." And 40 years later, I'm looking at that little bottle now of generics that comes from some factory in India. Uh, they don't won't tell you where. I, uh, what would have happened to me if I hadn't discovered better living through chemistry? And when I was young, I really resisted uh, taking a medication. And I knew about it because I had researched the scientific literature. But I put it off for two years until I had a very stressful eye operation where they had to take a little skin cancer off my lid margin, conscious needles and knives coming down at my eye. And that really stressed me out. And that's when I went on the med and I'm going, hmm, I just can't believe this. The other thing is don't get into escalating doses. Right. You'll get it, you'll get a nerve cycle. Nerves go in cycles. So the nerve cycle will go by. I've been on the same dose 40 years. You have to find the right drug. Um, and it's uh, I don't know what would have happened to me if I had not taking it. I don't know what happened to me if I ever stopped taking it. And I'm um, uh, hopefully I'm not going to get supply chain problems. Well, I already there's a bunch of alternates I can do. I've already researched that. But it really makes you, you know, some. I, I mean, I literally was coming apart physically completely. And this is what some people now I think are calling burnout. Sure. Sure. That's really really insightful so thank you for that and related to another question around children so we know from what you're saying that we've got visual thinkers so how would you suggest that we ascertain the children in our lives that are visual thinkers and the way that they should be taught is there a good way to test for that well, you can usually, visual thinkers usually love to build things. I mean, we've got kids today growing up that never use tools. Well, that's ridiculous. I was using tools by second and third grade and a little handsaw in fifth grade and pliers and hammers and screwdrivers like in second and third grade and, you know, taught how to use them safely. And so was every other kid in the neighborhood. You know, boys and girls both were, you know, using tools. It's, um, um, you, you know, they like to make things. Well, there's a lot of cardboard around, lots and lots of cardboard around, and it's free. You know, people, they, they, you give them, get them making stuff. Take the well, device yeah. away. Take the what? device away. And put the devices away. We've got to get the, a lot of the devices just put away. And they can have an hour a day to play video games. I know that some kids on the spectrum um, are, um, uh, getting really addicted to video games. Some of them get friends who talking uh, to, um, on games with other people. I, I don't want to totally get rid of that. But um, they get, a, get them interested in stuff that can turn into a career. The thing is, autism is a spectrum. One does a little bit geeky turn into autism. It's biologically a true continuous trait, truly continuous. And we wouldn't have any technology if it wasn't for having some autism genetics. It's a, it's many genes. It's, it's it, autism is caused by the same genes that make our brain big. Making a brain big is kind of a messy proposition. And so you're not going to find the genes, the same genes that make the brain big. You might want to look at this paper, genomic trade-offs, autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. Yes, they are. Read that paper. Genomic trade-offs, autism and schizophrenia, steep price for a human brain. That's really helpful. And just really thinking about some of the things that you've just been saying, one of the questions we've got here is actually from one of our business partners. Actually, it looks as though it's a connection of yours, 
Tara, and what they're asking is how how do visualizers operate as leaders? Would strategy be a strength for an object visualizer? Is that Would something strategy? that you can? Yeah. So in terms of a visual a visualizer. Well, what... visualizer, nothing's abstract. All right, let's take something like vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. Well, that stuff I would just visualize, like any other design project. Okay, so we're going to set something up in a stadium. First thing I would do is I don't try to wing it without knowledge. I'd call up every place they'd done it, find out all the screw-ups I did, but then I see it. You know, okay, so they left it on the loading dock and it ran out of dry ice. I got to make sure that doesn't happen. Also, I've had exposure to a lot of industrial supply chains, so I actually know how they work. But you see, there's nothing abstract about it. it it's, um, I see a container ship. And one of the other big issues we got today is you have so many students today, they don't know anything, where anything comes from. I showed a student a picture of a container ship that would have brought her sandals over from another country, and she didn't have any idea what it was. She was just sort of flabbergasted. Um, we have kids today that have never been on a farm. They don't know where food comes from. It's all become abstract. And then when we have a problem, like a storm, and they've stripped the grocery market shelves, then people get, you know, get concerned. But the thing about visual thinker is I can make a scenario in my mind, like water coming over the seawall. And I've worked 25 years in construction. I know exactly what's going to happen to the doors on that site. They're going to bust out, and the basement's going to be full of water. You see, I, I just see that. Um, so you need to have both kinds of of thinking. And I want to look into the history of this little swimming robot thing. As I looked at how they laid out the circuits, you know, instead of slapping them on a circuit board, I just mm -hmm. wonder if a guy in a shop did that. And I. Uh, the way they spaced out the, the, the you have chips and stuff that are inside that thing. I'm looking at the diagram this morning because I'm going to bet you there's an object visualizer somewhere involved in that thing. And they were mission critical for that product, project. And there's, I, I, see, the first step is understanding that people think differently and the different kinds of, of uh, things that they give to a project. We would have needed a little more object visualization uh, when, you know, to prevent the space shuttle from blowing up originally when these O-rings eroded. Yeah, uh, you know, and then Richard Feynman showed that in Congress, but, uh, you know, they it's sort of like mathematicians calculate risk, visual thinkers can see risk and say, so, well, okay, the O-rings got increasingly eroded, cold weather. No, the launch should have been canceled. It was too cold. You see how basic that is. You see, this is where, uh, well, that was a horrible tragedy. Um, it was very, very basic. The O-rings got eroded the colder it got. It was that simple. Disastrous consequences. I'm sure say guys in the shop going, no, no, guys in the shop would have been saying, cancel, cancel, cancel. No, I've been with those guys. We've sat in the job trailer and we used to talk about stupid suits. And now I've learned that that was wrong to say that. It's different ways of thinking. And the first step is, 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 is looking at, okay, what do the different ways of thinking contribute to a project? Respecting the different ways of thinking and they can complement each other. Because of, well, let's go back to building a food processing plant. Your degreed engineer who knows math does the boilers and the refrigeration. And the clever engineering department makes the clever equipment that goes inside. And a lot of the people I work with they were really, really good, maybe have 20 patents. They never touched refrigeration or boilers. You see, this is where you need to have the whole team. And back when I was working on these projects, I didn't have the knowledge I had now about object visualizers. I didn't even, I hadn't discovered the research until I did the autistic brain. And I would have been searching for that stuff. Well, like 2012, I would have done that. Yeah, and those examples you've given just highlight how important it is to have that diversity in all shapes and forms. And in terms oh, of us, and in terms of us, if we're not visual thinkers, 
what is what sort of practice what can we do to practice being more of a visualizer so that we can understand that well, perspective the first thing is to understand that it exists that's your first thing you've got to understand it exists and i didn't know i i thought everybody was a visual thinker i didn't discover this until i was in like my late 30s early 40s now if i if you ask me think about a church steeple i see specific ones i start seeing the churches around the neighborhood i was shocked when i asked a speech therapist who's a verbal thinker think about a church steeple and all she got was that that's all she got i was well, you see, I didn't realize all through my 20s and most of my 30s, I didn't know my thinking was different. So your first step is realizing that thinking is different. And then you can look at the kind of skills they can bring to the table. And they can be complementary skills. And I was not happy when I read in that coders book, that book called Coders, that some of the, you know, the mathematicians sort of stuck their nose up at the interface people. Well, the interface people are going to be object visualizers. I mean, the reason why Zoom got all the business is it was easy to use. Uh, and it didn't, and it, and it worked on poor internet connections. That, okay, that's the mathematician's part. You see, you have to have both. The object visualizer is just going to work on the interface. But they are both really important. So you, the first step is realizing that they exist. And then there's a lot of people that are mixtures. They're kind of mixtures of the different different things. Um, and there are a few mathematicians that have no visual thinking at all. Like if I said to you right now, you'll say you have a, a pet or, or your house, think about your house. You're probably in your house with a background up now. I think uh, Tara's got a background up. Uh, but I, most people, if they were in their office, they could visualize their own house. But I had dinner with a speech therapist and we were in her house and I asked her to visualize her office at the university. She could not visualize it. Now that's rare. She had, uh, uh, you know, that that's really extreme. Most people, if you force them, can start can visualize their own house. But when I ask you something you don't own, like a church steeple, so I found that really worked well for differentiating because they're all out there in the environment, people don't pay well i just don't pay much attention to them but they're there so i know that they would see them um and that's when i realized that something was very different i know i forget you know this was a a real well, a revelation i'm going you have got to be kidding i just couldn't believe it right. and so you have to realize it exists and and the different things that they can do yeah, it's embracing the different minds because both, as you say, has to be a team. One it has to be a team. That's right. the other. Yeah. It has to be a team. And I I got very upset about five years ago. I went to a very large, very high tech place. I'm not gonna say who it was. The engineers got the fancy offices in the tower, and my department got stuck in a service tunnel with cable trays. At, Every time I see a cable tray now, I get mad. And all right, one thing you know, I don't want to say about the meat industry, we're democratic. In the meat industry, everybody had a crappy office. <laughs> yeah, so we're democratic on that. Ugh. But I was kind of shocked when I, I got out in some other industries and I, I was pleased to see that NASA at least is giving some credit to some of the machinists that worked on these rovers but every part on that thing got made in a shop. Yeah, it needs to get more respect. It's mission critical. And I've been looking at the beautiful pictures coming back from Mars. I just can't believe how clear the photography is. I'm sure math has a lot to do with that, but I'm looking at the parts of the rover that I can see very clearly. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the guys in the shop. They matter. They need to get more credit. Absolutely. You what you work with guys in the shop. It's that simple. Or yeah, gals in the shop. I should be. I know if I forgot this is women and uh, uh, but they it it matters. The other thing that um I learned to do since I was weird and I never disclosed was 
just show the work off. I just showed off the work. Drawings, photos, trade magazine articles. I also saw doors. Like there's that scene in the movie where I get the editor's card. That's very early in my career because I realized if I wrote for our state farm magazine, that would help my career. I saw that door. Doors are everywhere. Back doors are everywhere. People don't see them. I got that card and I produced the article. And then after that, I did some um, columns for them and then they started to pay me. Um, but that was a back door. And I had guts to go up and get that card. And then a week later, I produced a, a summary of my master's thesis on cattle squeeze shoots. I like that. I think people need to always see an opportunity as a door that should be opened and, and to forge forward. And you've done that. Well, that's a really important scene in the movie. Also, if you want to understand visual thinking, watch the movie. That is the most accurate part yeah. of the movie. It shows exactly how I think. It's absolutely yeah. accurate. Now, there's some stuff like that crazy horse. I wasn't that crazy. That was an exaggeration. But the, the visual thinking and the projects are all real. And, and my mentors, Ann and Mr. Carlock, they were totally real. So certainly in terms of the person that's asked that question, I think that's an even more reason to go and have a little look at the movie just to get some of those examples. Um, I see that we're getting close to time, but there's a question here that's related. So we've been talking a lot about the sort of visual element. So someone's asking here about what are your thoughts on dyslexia and creative thinking? Because we've spoken a lot about visual thinking. What are your a thoughts lot, on that? A lot of dyslexics are visual thinkers. There's a lot of visual uh, thinkers that are dyslexics. Now there's some dyslexics that when they go to read, they'll see the print jiggle on the page. Try uh, putting the work on some maybe pale pastel paper. You know, and I want to say, well, that's not even showing up the right color there. Um, you know, like pale blue, pale gray, uh, pale tan. But a lot of dyslexics are visual thinkers. And, and I, you know, there's kids that have taken shop in school and then they end up um, doing, um, you know, doing uh, things with shop. Um, yeah, the, if we get rid of all of the all of the different kinds of you know minds i um, well we wouldn't have any tech we need the different kinds of minds and 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 the uh, and what i think has happened in education is the verbal thinkers have totally taken over because when i look at what they've done to math they've made weird verbal algebra out of it Okay, so I'm supposed to use weird verbal algebra. This was a thing on a sample SAT uh, to um, figure out how much road a contractor would build in a year. I go, really now? That's simple fifth grade math. Fifth grade, fifties arithmetic. I just thought that was ridiculous. Good. So related to that, there's a question here about education. So what do you think we could do to train teachers so that they're better able to cater for children on the spectrum. Well, so I think we need to actually get that more out of education. Keep the hands-on classes in the school, and and we got kids today that can't just do arithmetic to you know balance a checkbook or um, uh, you know find the area of a circle. I know how to do that because I've sized hydraulic and pneumatic cylinders. I know how to find the area of a circle. I'm practical math of the way it used to be taught. I, I looked up the common core stuff in math. I thought it was kind of crazy. I actually liked the common core stuff in English. I thought the common core stuff in English was good. We also don't have enough emphasis on teaching kids to write. We're having a lot of problems now with graduate students, awful writing skills. And I'm have to, having to correct grammar in their journal articles and in their theses. Now, I didn't used to have to do that before. Well, you see, it takes time for a teacher to correct papers. Now they say it hurts their self-esteem. But one of the problems is, is that the correct grammar on a whole bunch of papers takes time and they don't want to do it. But that's how I learned how to write. In ninth grade, when I got thrown out of a high school for, for throwing a book at a girl, my writing was better than a lot of graduate students today. Well, because teachers marked up my work and I had to correct it. That's how I learned how to write. Yeah. Very important. We need to start looking at 
what a person can do. I liked what Stephen Hawking had to say about disability. Concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. He could do one thing well, math in his head, really well. Oh, that's been really great, Dr. Grandin. Tara, I'm keeping a conscious eye on the time. So thank you very much for all the questions. I'm just going to hand over to Tara to take us over the line. Thank you, Tara. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Grandin, it's been an honor and an absolute pleasure to get to know you and have an opportunity to speak with you. And I do hope we have an opportunity to speak with you again in the future. Um, I'd also like to thank our broader audience, not only the SUSE colleagues, but um, the organizations that have joined us externally, and uh, hope that they've enjoyed the SUSE's Women in Tech conversation and this series with Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, and it's they're been free an absolute to pleasure. Okay, I've got one of my other problems. I interrupted you. I have problems with the timing because if I was a computer, I'd only be an Intel 286, but I got a gigantic <laughs> graphics memory. I got a whole uh, a whole uh, a data center full of servers for graphics memory. I, I just want to tell the people that are watching, you have permission to use this recording for, you know, copy it, uh, post it, whatever you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any closing words you'd like to share with our broader I, audience, Dr. Grandin? I, I'm seeing too many smart kids with labels going nowhere. Yeah. And we've got to get creative and and we've got to control the video game playing and we got to replace it with other things like building things, showing them cool math sites like Wolfram Mathematica, introducing math kids to programming. And a lot of this stuff is free online. I, I'm kind of, a, there seems to be no creativity in, in figuring out what to do with these kids. They're getting too locked into the medical model. I'm going to finish up with a really stupid medical model for an airplane and it's real gobbledygook. I had a flight grounded because she had a microbleed in the anterior proximal rotary appendage. Now that's gobbledygook. That's medical gobbledygook that described a, a little hydraulic leak in an airplane. Uh, I'd, no, we've got to kind of bust out of that total medical model. I'm seeing too many smart kids going nowhere. Right. And where they, and then I go out to Silicon Valley and, and then I go in the shop Okay, I've done a lot of work with the clever engineering department in the shop. In the big shop I used to work with, they just fixed trucks in it now. Very sad. It's no longer a shop. Because the investment people got a hold of stuff and said, well, we'll just farm, they just said we'll just farm out all the work instead of building things ourselves. That's why we have to import it from Holland now. Oh, I want to you know commend the Dutch for having the foresight to keep all their skilled trade stuff. But I saw all kinds of people that would be all kinds of labels working in the shop. I've seen all kinds of labels working out in Silicon Valley. Then I go to an autism meeting and I see the junior edition of the same kind of kid and he's going nowhere. Because, and part of the problem is you have a label that goes from very, very, very severe disability to somebody where it's just a personality variant. And we need to be, um, uh, and nobody, the kid's not doing any hands-on things. Nobody thought to teach the kid higher math. And the stuff's free online. Or you get the old math books out of the attic. They're free. Yeah. Uh, people don't see it. They just don't see it. Well, Dr. Grandin, you've given such fantastic ideas for the audience, for um, you know, across gender on how to continue to challenge and to persevere. And I just have to say thank you again. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And thank you well, to the thank broader you. audience. And Mentors were really important, and after I got out in the industry and the middle management was torturing me, um, there were some very good mentors in the industry came because they saw my work, and they they really helped me a whole lot. Great. Well, that concludes our talk today. So I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your day, and I wanted to again say thank you, and we'll uh, we'll meet again soon, hopefully. Okay. All right, great. Wonderful to talk to you. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.